today and it's been raining like for the last 20 months or so. <laughs> anyway, if you don't know who I am, I'm John Webster, I'm the president of this nice society. And uh, called the meeting to order. And we've got a bit of stuff to go through here before uh, our speaker gets up, uh, including the election. And I'm sure a lot of you here in order to put your hand up and say yes, I'd like to be a director. Um, I'm going to skip all that stuff and go to the Treasury's report, just as a matter of interest. As of May the 25th, uh, $4,513.93 in the Lakeview Historical Society account. Uh, reports on committees. Uh, the only committee that's running right now is the War Vets Committee, uh, which is comprised of myself, uh, Ted Morin, where Ted said, oh, there he is, he had his head down. You could see it's a glare on the top <laughs> And Sheila. Uh, we have was educated in England. We got a BSD at Southampton in 1963. That was the year before I got married. At least I wish I didn't do that. <laughs> Actually, you came to Canada the year I did get married in 64. Um, uh, this, this gentleman. A lot, of, a lot of scholastic training. He graduated from Calgary with an MSc. He later got a PhD at Western University in 73. Uh, and then he became on um, the faculty of uh, geography at Trent University in 1969. He's obviously lectured and, and undertaken research on historical uh, geographic. geographic of geographic geography and yeah, didn't learn to read very good. Uh, okay, since retirement, Alan has completed research on the anti submarine uh, fair mile motor launches. <coughs> it navigated the Trent Waterway and served in Royal Canadian Navy in the Second World War. I was not aware of that. Mind you, I was only one year old when the first one down by here, apparently. Uh, Alan lives with his wife, Catherine, on Long Lake near Lakefield. And they undertake a variety of retirement type activities. So, without further ado, I'm going to pass Alan to the reporter and start his uh, presentation. Do I need this? Do you have any? Shall I use it? Please use it. Okay. Well, good evening. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the opportunity of speaking to you about this topic, which I'm very interested in. Um, I've got a PowerPoint presentation with about uh, 85 slides. I've got about 45 minutes to talk. It's more like a super movie, I think. Mean, Okay. Here may be great. Anyway, um, great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Um, the topic of my talk has been on the screen for some time, so you probably have read it. Um, Warships on the waterway, 100 million yard fair fair miles during World War II. I taught geography at Trent University, but I was always interested in this topic after I found out about it about 25 years ago, but I couldn't fit it into my geography courses. There would have been questions raised, so I waited until I retired in about 2008, way 2008, to start focusing on it. And the unfortunate thing about that, by the way, is that most of the men were dead that were involved in this by that stage. I met very few veterans who were actually on these boats from World War II. Um, so it should have been undertaken, the research should have been undertaken much earlier. I better talk to the slides actually as I um, get through this. And um, I have this uh, device. Uh, I don't 
I hope you can see the uh, slide clearly. This topic um, about the winter boats and the motor launches around the Trent Canal was uh, something I knew nothing about. And the first clue I had was when I saw this photograph um, in the also the lift log interpretation center. It's the well by parts Canada. You know where it is it's just below the lift logs. And uh, about 1991, I think it was, I went in there and I was looking at the pictures and I was amazed to see this photograph because it was labeled um, Royal Canadian Navy motor launch. Um, Q109 is the number on the road in the lift log. What on earth is a road It should be on the North Atlantic, country submarine. This is like 1943. Anyway, that piqued my interest. I sort of retained that information. And I spoke to people about it over over the next few years. But as I said, I didn't sit to teach the topic or do any further research. I didn't really have time to. But uh, this is the first uh, clue that I had, and I think that picture is still in the lift lock uh, display, actually. So I'm, I'm going to talk about my story about the Trent Canal Fair Miles during World War II. First of all, my interest, and then secondly, what was a fair mile? Third, why were fair miles needed in World War II? Fourthly, who built them, when and where? Fifth, Navigating the Trent Waterway, say, tank ports in World War II, and said, what does it all mean? Okay, so my interest, first of all, I grew up in England, almost near the middle of England, nowhere near the sea. So I was always very interested in the ocean, I had a very, and ships, I had a very romantic view of it. I used to read books like the books by C.F. Forrest. Has anybody here read C.F. Forrest's books? Because they're, they're for young youth, not children, but young people. And they're about the Napoleonic Wars, the hero is Captain Hornborn. Anyway, I read those and I loved them. And then later in life, actually around the time I saw the picture in the Lindenbach display, I found out about Patrick O'Brien. Anybody who read Patrick O'Brien, I highly recommend them. They're for a more adult audience to see as far as they're. They're really well written, and there's a, quite a few of them. Uh, it's about so the Napoleonic Wars once again, and uh, the hero is a dashing captain in the Royal Navy. They made a movie, by the way, about these with the name Captain Master and Commander, um, slash the far side of the world. It came out about 13, 14 years ago. And uh, of course, I, I went to see it. Russell Crowe played the lead. Yeah, one critic called it, called it testosterone drenched. <laughs> it's, it's very gung ho, masculine heroics. In fact, there's only one woman in the movie. She's a sort of total bystander in a boat for about a minute in Brazil. Anyway. So a lot of it is just romantic, battle-driven interest that I had. And uh, I never lost that interest, and of course I was reading about the Napoleonic Wars, but my topic tonight was about World War II. So the information I needed to talk about, the, to, to do research on, on this topic, was information about the boats that went through uh, the Trent Canal. I knew that one the one in the lip lock picture, obviously, but there were other ones. So I, first of all, I, I wanted to get photographs, and then I looked for publications. Uh, of course, there are archives, huge archives, on the Canadian Armed Forces in World War II in the National Archives. So I could get logbooks on each of the boats. And then there's the Department of National Defense files about the boats, about the movements of boats and collisions, etc. And then I also wanted to talk to people, if I could find them, about these boats and uh, where they're constructed and where they went. So I, I went on the hunt for this sort of stuff. Um, 
I was very lucky because I started talking to people about it, and somehow I was put in contact with this chap, Don Haddon. He's still alive. He's an ex RCN. He wasn't in World War II, and he was in the Korean War and served in the early 1950s, and actually was on a fair mile once. But he's a keen modeler. Of course, he's been he, he aged now, but uh, I got invited to the unveiling of his model of the first of these fair mile motor launches that were built, was built in Canada, the 060. And John built this in his garage. His workshop, which is uh, in in Barry, lived in Barry, and it was uh, put on display. And it is still on display in the Georgian Mall in Barry. It's a very good, large model of the Q060, which is the first one that was built in Canada, and it was built in Aurelia actually by the new boats. And I went to the event, certainly May 1988. Or and then I got lucky again because the gentleman of the unveiling was Donald Hunter on the left, who was the uh, one of the people involved in the actual company, the Hunter Capital's company in Aurelia that built the boats, came down the train canal through Lake Gilbert. So both Donalds were there, Donald Hunter and Don Adam, and they, they were under, and Donald Hunter unveiled this. Uh, I got a point of it. Of course, the middle thing, yeah, you see. This is models, it's still displayed in the Georgian Mall. And uh, the interesting thing, they gave him a plaque, but they gave him a plaque, don't cut your plaque. He was at 89 then. And this was the only one of the boats that was named. It was named the Mariposa Bell. <laughs> And uh, obviously, to Aurelia, they were not named, they were numbered. And they weren't actually called ships, by the way, they were called um, motor launches. Anyway, um, the first one didn't have a name. Don Hunter died in 2000, but I was, I met him then, and I managed to get an interview with him later on that year, in 1998. I got a long interview recorded with him, which was invaluable. And then he subsequently wrote this uh, history of the Hunter Boats Company, which came out posthumously in 2000, just after he died. So the story of Hunter Boats, uh, that's one of their advertisements. Okay, the second point, what were these boats? Well, they were fair mile B motor launches. Uh, they were called fair mile because the Company name was Fair Mile, it was based in Surrey in England. They were B because there were six different models uh, both made. They were sort of prefabricated boats in a sense. They, they, were, they were patterns that were made of wood and they could easily be uh, copied worldwide almost. Um, they, this was the B uh, model and um, all the motor, the anti suffering boats that came from Lake were the B model, and they all had these characteristics. They were 112 feet long, 17 feet 10 inches wide, and 4 feet 10 inches deep. Yeah, drop 79 tons. They had twin gasoline engines, 630 horsepower. They could do about 20 knots full flat out. They had 17 men on board, three officers, and they had armaments. The main armament was the depth charge for depth gun U boats, but they did also have uh, deck guns, a three pound gun, and an anti aircraft gun. Um, why were they needed? Well, Canada went wholeheartedly into the war as soon as it was announced, World War II, as soon as it broke out, so in support of Britain. And obviously, they needed to. Uh, have services, uh, Navy, Air Force, and Army. There were only 13 ships in the Royal Canadian Navy at the beginning of the war, and so there was great need for ships and of all classes, including the motor launchers. Amazingly enough, by the end of the war, May 1945, Canada had 378 ships, which is amazing. It's the fourth largest Navy in the world in 1945, and um, 
the policy had a huge part to play in uh, maritime activities, principally in convoys shipping supplies to Britain from Canada from North America. So the Department, Department of National Defense issued contracts for making fair miles, the Canadian boat yard, uh, all, almost out to, immediately after the beginning of the war. And uh, most of these were made in Ontario. There were five shipyards in Ontario, the boat yards. There were two in British Columbia and one in Nova Scotia. This is odd in a way, but these are small boats. They could be made in the, on the lakes and, and get down the canals, whereas the very big ships were made on, on the ocean dockyards in uh, Nova Scotia, mainly or New Brunswick. So altogether, there were 80 fair mile of motor launches made in Canada during the war, from about 1941 to 1944, those 40 years. Um, they were called His Majesty's Canadian Motor Launchers, HMCML, and they were given uh, a letter, Q, a class called Q, and then they were numbered from 50 to 129. There was 80 numbers between 50 and 129. The first built was the, was the 60, it was 60 oh, in fact. Uh, they were needed to chase or hunt down German submarine boat, U boats, underwater boats, which was a huge threat to convoys going across from Canada and from the United States to Britain. And that was their main role. They were coastal ships, really. They didn't have the, the capacity to travel very far from the coast. They were relatively small. They only had relatively small gas tanks. And so they were based in coastal ports, and then they went for a day or two or three days, and then they returned or go to another port for refueling. Okay, so during 1941-42, the war was going badly for the Allies. And uh, a large reason for this was the U-boats in the Atlantic. Uh, this is the, from the Beaver Examiner, the 2nd of April, 1942. This is a big mistake, and I was born on it, by the way. Oh, uh, 300 U-boats to be let loose on shipping. Um, so there was a, this huge threat. And uh, most of the main German effort Maritime effort with underwater boats, by the way, U boats. They had a few battleships, but those were nailed by the Royal Air Force in the uh, uh, quite quickly. These uh, U boats were the main threat. Um, 28 destroyed, but raids sent to low. Uh, uh, this is just one. This is an interesting flat. This has been uh, one of the Navy clubs in Ontario. This is the 24 ships that were sunk in World War II, Canadian ships. A warship, I mean, not, not a, a merchant ship. And many of these were sunk very close to Canadian shores, in fact. We say it's the Battle of the Atlantic, but there was also a battle called the Battle of the St. Lawrence. Because it was in the St. Lawrence Estuary, or the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and the Estuary, that a lot of the U boat attacks took place, inside the land in many cases. It's been called the second major invasion of Canada, because it was all within Canadian waters. Um, the bases that the, well, here's uh, obviously, this is, the, this is where they were made. They went down the St. Lawrence, and then they were based in five main bases in, in and around the Gulf of Lawrence. The main one was Halifax. And then you had Sydney, up, and there was uh, Sydney, Cape Red Island, which is Nova Scotia, too. And then they made the base in Gas Bay, Quebec. And then there were two bases outside Canada for the Fairmile Bays, the uh, St. John's and uh, Botwood in uh, Newfoundland. Newfoundland was outside Canada then, which is the Dominion on the uh, um, tricky part of Canada. So this was it's something called Black Week, <laughs> the week around the middle of May 1942, it was like 75 years ago exactly. Um, torpedoing, torpedoing coal reaches 18 in the St. Lawrence. So this is, this is actually in the St. Lawrence. And uh, it describes the torpedoing of uh, merchant ships in the St. Lawrence on the night of the 15th of May. And this is often done with inside a shore. Um, this is also the Beaver Examiner on 15th of May. 
submarines stop ship of the plant pineapples. I found that was all amusing actually because uh, obviously Canada was still getting uh, food from the Caribbean, this is Cuba, for pineapples, and he was going to have to do with that. Britain, of course, they had never thought pineapple for six years. Um, then this is later on in May, May 26th, 1942, the race for life. And you've got a cartoon here with a riveter working on a ship, ship sinking, ship launching. So there's obviously great concern about losses and trying to replace them. Uh, this is an interesting this is from the Aurelia Packet at Times. It just shows you the effort that Canada put into the war. This is the 23rd of October 1941, a bit, a bit earlier. What is Canada, what, what Canada is doing towards winning? Canada to build ships. Canada's Navy expanded tenfold. And then this diagram, it shows Canada's direct war expenditures, World War I, World War II. A hundred years ago, the year of Vimy Ridge, Canada was spending eight hundred forty thousand dollars per day on World War One. In nineteen forty-one, they were spending two and well, two and took over two million dollars a day on World War. II. Well, that was a day. It was going for another forty years. The next year is four million dollars a day. That's amazing. Considering the country was only about uh, fifteen million people, that was an amazing effort. Anyway, who built the fair miles when and where? Well, where and when? The Hunter Fair, the, the boat yard I'm talking about, the one in Aurelia, was called Hunter Boats, and it was owned by Alastair Hunter, this chap here. Alastair, spelled correctly, by the way, with an E. And his son, Donald Hunter, was his assistant. Um, and Al Alastair Hunter uh, was the He's a, quite a smart guy, actually, because uh, he ran this company and uh, he was from Gravenhurst or the Gravenhurst area. And he worked for Ditchburn Boats, which was based on uh, Lake of Bays or one of the big lakes, interior lakes, not that way, in the late 1920s and 1930s. And they expanded to Aurelia in about 1930 or 1929. Of course, there was a huge economic crash in 1929. There was a good crash following it. So the different boats chiseled out. But Alistair Hunter bought the boat yard in Aurelia from them and established his own boat yard in 1932. Now, it wasn't a very good time to start a company. There wasn't a lot of orders. But he managed to keep it going, mainly repairing boats until the late 30s when the, the, there was the rumblings of war and the Department of National Defense started to order small craft, uh, uh, various uh, types of army and, and maybe small craft boats for harbor, harbor work and stuff like that. Anyway, he then managed to get a contract with two fair miles in 1941. Now, why would you award a contract to build a naval boat, a boatyard on an interior lake. This isn't just the Great Lakes, this is a lake off the Great Lake. Why would they get a contract? Seems mad. That's what originally I was so puzzled by. But he realized, Alistair Hunter realized that these boats would fit in the Trent Canal Lock. Because the Trent Canal Locks are 120 feet, more or less, what the minus the foot. All around the Trent Canal, they're all having, this is 112 feet long. So there's four feet freeway at each end. They would fit sideways easily because all the locks are about 33 feet wide, and it's only 17 feet wide. But he, he bid it, knowing that, and knowing he could deliver the boats down the train canal. So he got to the contract in 1941, and then, having done, built those successfully, managed to get five more contracts in 1942, 1943 period. So there were seven altogether. And then after World War II, there was also another fairly large boat called the Blue Heron, which I'll mention briefly. It's nothing to do with the war that was not here. Thank you. So, if you know Aurelia, you know Lake Pusikin is the sort of northern extension of Lake Simcoe, and there's a church chain park there. And that park is relatively new. The boat yards occupy the southern end of that park. There's a plaque there. And this photograph is, is of the boat yard 
which is now gone, they had the boat shed which could accommodate the, the fair miles totally and they could build them inside and there was a railway system that um, was used for laundry. This is the system, but it's not the, I couldn't get a picture of the Aurelio boat, but this is the, in Midland, there was a similar railway system, they launched the big fair mile to the split backwards, and then they put the mast and the guns on as a wash line. The Aurelio factories uh, were, were involved in the war work, and this article from the Aurelio uh, packet at the time, the 3rd of October 1941, mentions the boats being built at 100 boats as part of the Aurelio factory war effort, and this advertisement. Um, talked about, we'll do our best, we're engaged in construction of war crowd, but we'll endeavor to meet the products that are by our many customers. And there's a picture of a 112 foot bear my life without bringing a control boat floating on the future thing there, it's a 100 boat uh, ad. So the Fairmile boat yards, apart from the one in Aurelia, which is, I have got mine here, were four. There was the painter boats in Toronto, Mac Craft in Sardinia, Grivet and Grew boats in Penetagrachin, and Midland boats and Minette Field boats in, in Midland. Most of the fair miles that were built actually were built around Midland and Penetangrachin. They were very productive. There were three companies there. There were some built in these other ones too. But most, most of the 80 were built in Ontario. Okay, so they had to deliver these boats. They built them. Obviously, they had to get them to the, the scene of war, which is the North Atlantic. And so they had to come through the Trent Waterway. These were too big to ship on trucks. A lot of the small boats were had by railways, by the harbor craft. They might not want to have a railway from Korea, but these were too big. So um, during the period, 1941-44, there were seven fair miles built by hundred boats, and they all came down the, the Trent. Pairs of boats came down in October 1941 and October 1942. <laughs> Single boat came down in the summer of 42, the summer of 43, and the summer of 44. That adds up to seven. They were not commissioned in the Royal Canadian Navy until they reached the Lake Ontario. So they were still company responsibility and they had pilots on board to navigate the shallow sections, particularly lakes on the Trent Canal. These were steamboat pilots who knew the canal. And they were commissioned in the Royal Canadian Navy at Trenton on Lake Ontario once they arrived there. So the actual navigation, you know where it really is, it's the junction of the northern end of Lake Simcoe and Lake Kikuchi thing basically. So they came across Lake Simcoe and entered the Trent Canal, went east, and then through a variety of small lakes also is one of the larger ones, Cameron, Sturgeon, then it's the Royal Lakes, Blackthorn, sorry, Pigeon, Blackthorn, Shimon, etc. etc. And then down there, Donovan, Rice Lake, and then down the Trent to Trenton, and then they commissioned on the Bay of Quinty. They did sea trials actually on the Bay of Quinty. One of the problems um, of getting down the Trent was the shallow nature of the head, the height of land, the headwaters of the uh, what you call that, at the uh, summit of the canal. Because it actually comes up from Lake Fitco, and then it comes down from uh, Sturridge, from Bolton Lake, or this is actually a lake called Canal Lake, which is an artificial lake. That's the highest point on the Trent Canal, it's about uh, 85 meters above sea level, about 270 feet above sea level. And uh, there's not a lot of water running into that because there's no great land mass higher than it. So it tends to be uh, short of water and very shallow. It also was artificial. They had to fell trees. There's stumps there. And um, that's why they needed the pilot. And that was one of the tricky parts, getting through Boston Lake and those other shallow lakes, where you could easily ground on the bottom. Another problem, which I don't think I got, Another problem was uh, at Lovesick Lake Lock. There's a, there's a uh, there's Lower Buckhorn Lake, below Buckhorn, then you got Lovesick Lake, and then you're in the vertical. 
So anyway, apparently the plural, the elastic leg lock is a very slight, smaller thigh than the cell. There's a cell, a cement cell near the lock gate, and they had to turn the boat diagonally to fit. So even though the lock was supposed to be 120 feet long, it wasn't. And turn it, and then they can close the lock gate. But the pilot uh, came down, and uh, they were all successfully brought down the um, the canal. Anyway, I'm going to go through the years now. You've all been waiting to see these boats, <laughs> so we're going to go through the scene. By the way, I wanted to get photographs, and I I only had that one so, uh, that was in the lift lock um, display. So I, I put a letter in the uh, newspaper in uh, 2009, I think it was. Um, Beaver Examiner, Lakefield, uh, Hamilton Paper, Belleville, and others up and down the system. And uh, in the hope that people would respond to this request for information about these boats, and particularly for photographs, and I managed to get all sorts of photographs of every, every boat. So that then gave me confidence to proceed, and I'm going to show you some of these photographs right now. Um, the 060 was the first boat. Uh, built and it came down in 1941. It was the first Ontario built fair mile. October 1941 came through the canal with the OSIC 1. That was a pair of boats. Kathy Hook, you may know, she lives in Peterborough. She grew up in around here. She went to school in Lakefield. Her class was taken, I think it was her grade six class or grade three class or something, to uh, see this boat go through the Lakefield Lock 27. In, 19, in October 1941, and her uncle George Malice Douglas, who lived up near Young Point, uh, I believe, uh, I remember the name of the farm, North Cove, yeah. Uh, he was a good photographer, and he took the pictures. And so, Kathy, when I spoke to her about this, she said, Well, I've got pictures of them. So, she provided me very good pictures of the first two boats. Um, the pilot was William Scholar, who was based at Young Point. And he piloted all the way to Lakefield. I'm sure. It was reported in the Peter Examiner as having tied up uh, at the government wharf in Peterborough on the 21st of October. So the one of the George Mallis, George Hunt, uh, Douglas, <laughs> Douglas, he's up there actually, George Douglas, and Victor. Uh, in the 060, and I think this is Lakefield Lock. I can't understand that building. Yeah. At this point, the building is on the other side. Is this young point? Is this young point? Yeah. yeah. Is this young Star Lakefield? Okay, I can't understand this building. It must be gone. No, it's there. Let's go ahead and ask her say. Well, I thought this was Lakefield, anyway. It could be Young's point. It would make sense to join the conspiracy theory. Yeah. Anyway, you can see the um, detailed business that back to the deck gun, this green one, the deck gun, all the leaves. The ship is still being fixed. They're still working on the launch. The company the carpenters and other churches are working on it. It's going down. And for example, there's no mast. They actually lay the mast down to the so many bridges. Um, there's no there's no rear gun and there's no depth charge gun. But the 060 was the first. It was reported in the Peter Examiner on the 22nd of October 1941. Now it's not exactly what it is it? Now, the Germans are the bouncing on Moscow. There's uh, various other things going on in uh, Europe, North Africa, but it actually got a picture on the front page. Well, most of the story is on page two. So this picture is, is off the Osiko at the Wharf of Hebrew with an inset of William Scholar, the pilot. Just armed patrol boats go down the train canal on which we coast. And then the story continues on the inside. And this is the best coverage of any of the boats. There was never subsequently any photographs or any uh, real story about it. I think it's sensitive about it, actually. Because why would you 
Well, the newspaper stories about your war efforts, particularly the Pacific ships and motor launches in the game. This is the earlier back in Times, uh, and it says another fair mile launched in uh, the really old read the whole thing. But this is the 061. So this is the second one. The 061 and the 061 made, were made together and we worked together. So I was given this picture by um, Judith Mallory. Edith. Edith. Edith Mallory and her husband. Uh, they escaped before death. His father was the chief engineer or the mechanical engineer of 400 boats. Well, they had these pictures. And I think the stars that were made on here. You can see the gunners are there. They're still working on it, although they launched it, you see, flying very hard. Uh, that one they, they pinched to, by the way. So the music one was worked on, uh, subsequent to that picture, and then it came down with the O6 in October 22nd, right? Where it was. The interesting thing on October 22nd is you can't come down the canal now on October 22nd, January. It closes the bank day. The Thanksgiving is the same day. But they have special permission to come down after Thanksgiving. The technical authorities leaked some of the agreement that they you know, entered into just because that they were up against it in terms of delivery. So they came down after the canal was officially closed. And uh, I don't know what this is. It's recognize that bar, I don't know. Recognize that fence? This is, might be on the O'Connor River below Lakefield, or it might be between the other shores. This probably goes to Northcote Farm, actually. But um, whether this is a road here, I don't know. But uh, in, I mean, if you're standing on the shore here, it's a fairly narrow section of Lake Tatooine, but that's anyway. This is the, similar to the music so got a deck gun here. You can see it a, what looks like a commissioned officer on the bridge. And in fact, all the photographs show personnel, and they are both company and RCN, the mixture. The, the, um, this is the music one again. Um, I don't know exactly where this is. It's taken from looks like the other shore on the other side of the river. Um, around that time. So those two boats went down in, in uh, the fall of uh, 1941. Hunter Brothers then got another set of contracts for the next year. So 1942, um, a single boat went down in May 1942, the 085. It looks very similar to the previous one, the lettering similar. I've uh, got a deck gun with masters on the deck somewhere. You can see the naval rating here, company men there. And uh, this is taken, by the way, I, I got lucky because um, the archivist of the Camel British Historical Society, Anne Linton, said, uh, contacted me after reading the letter of the paper and said, Oh, my dad took pictures of those books. He was a photographer for the examiner. He was also the mayor of Hamilton. So she had terrific photographs of three other ships in uh, 1942. The 085 came down on its own. Uh, the 085 is of Lakefield interest because it came through Lakefield. And by the way, the, the, ship, the journey down the canal was three days. They, they, came from Aurelia to Fenland Falls, and they tie up at Fenland Falls the first night. And they came from Fenland Falls to Peterborough, second day, and then they get down to Camford, and then to Trenton. They tied up at Camford. So the only five came through in May 1942. They birthed in Lakefield and tied up actually at the, at the school. Somehow they tied up at the school. Lakefield Treasury School Road because the uh, headmaster requested it. I'm going to pass around the letter. I've got my hand out here for a minute. Sees around.
I don't have a slide of this letter. There's a letter from the headmaster of the Grove in Archer School to the uh, Department of Naval Defense, National Defense Service, and uh, acknowledging and thanking them for stopping the uh, tying up at the uh, school, the Zoe Five. Um, he, he ran the uh, cadet program, sea cadet program at the school, and he had great interest. Uh, he was a reserve officer in the Navy. Anyway, they volunteer in this letter, if you read it, to correspond with the boat and sort of send the care packages. They want to adopt the old fire. In fact, it doesn't seem to be fast. Okay, so Frank Henson's pictures are terrific, and this is another one they weighed five in what I think is lot 13. Here comes the, it's just about to go down in the lock, descend the, yeah, obviously descend the lock, pull up and all the going to get the water. But I think this is Frank Campbell, I think Frank Campbell, Ben Mallory, the chef here. He looks like a um, manager. It's a it's May. It must be warm. And they're all sort of shirt sleeves. Here's a naval rating. He's a company man. Other company um, employees there. This may be a company employee on the other side of the, of the, of the lot. And this is the 085. You can see that's in the number. It's the 085. Okay, so then in the fall, another pair of boats went down, and once again, probably in late October. And this is the somewhat different looking, partly because of the number, the, the labeling is much smaller than the previous one. And they also painted the hull in what's called a disruptive pattern. The disruptive pattern was supposed to help this, it's a camouflage, it should help disguise the profile of the ship on the on the sea. I don't know whether they, it's kind of like they rushed into painting it for the uh, trip down the Dragon Canal, but um, it is the disruptive pattern that a lot of the ships use when they were cleaning. Uh, once again, you can see uh, a naval RCN rating there, and an officer there, and a few other people. There's the mouth, the part there. They don't see no gun up at this point. And then the 092 tied up in Camford. I'm not sure the date, but Frank Lim's picture once again clearly shows the Camford uh, skyline. And people must have known about this because there's quite a crowd to uh, to look at it. You can sort of see the people congregating around here. And there's a seaman on the boat. I'm not sure about what these two people are doing down here, actually. I'm not worried about them. You don't seem to be paying attention to the uh, principal object of interest. They probably got that. They probably said, We're going down to see the boat. And uh, use it as an excuse. Then the 093 came down in tandem with the 092. This is a boat. This is a shot actually on the Once again, we think this is Ben Mallory, the superintendent of the plant operation. And it doesn't have the gun on it. It has the mask on at this point. They take the mask down, actually. This is on Lake Kuchiching, and then later on it comes through um, Camelford. Camelford's got a high road bridge now. He's been through Camelford. You don't have to wait for the lift bridge anymore. But they had to lift the bridge for, for um, the boat to go through it. This is the 093. It's an officer on the bridge. And uh, is yeah, we still have to work on the. Uh, one of the things they found the, the all the Ontario producer uh, boat builders found it, that it was a very long-winded process dealing with the federal government, particularly the Department of National Defense bureaucracy. So they got together and formed the Ontario Fair Mile Association in about 1942, and uh, Al Hunter was the chair of it. And the president and Don Hunter was the secretary. Don Hunter had an amazing life. He was only about 21 when he was uh, involved with this, and he was in uh, some groups, subcommittees on the negotiations, going to Ottawa, negotiating with the Department of National Defense. 
uh, on a good monthly basis. So, for a young man, it was quite an experience. And he ran the company, by the way, for another 30 years after World War II. So, this is an emergence from the end here, Fear Model Association. And uh, in war and in peace, the craft men have faith in. This is a strong Fear Model, actually. It's a much bigger ship. One of the big puzzles to me in my research is I cannot find any records of the Fairmont Association. If I had, I could have done a much better job of the research. And I can't believe they've been thrown out. Anyway, I won't, I won't go there at the moment, but that's just that's a comment. 1943, the third year, a um, bunch of boats built, two ships in this year, which is the sixth and seventh. The last two, in fact. The Q109 is shown at Harborside, at Wharfside, by the Thunderbolts of Wharf in uh, Lake Kuchiche. And uh, they, you know, they got that. I think this is Lake Kuchiche. Maybe Trenton. I think it's there. So the gun's there. And then it looks like it, the anti aircraft gun going through. But uh, this is the one I'm guarding in the States. And this is the one I first of all saw in the photograph in the Nithlock uh, Museum. I, meant, uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the big parts of the Nithlock display. And Dave Edgerton gave me these photos. Dave Edgerton is a huge uh, proponent of uh, military mem uh, memory, memorabilia in Peterborough, as you're probably well aware. And these are photographs taken in or around Peterborough. I've got a feeling this isn't Peterborough. I think this is Lakefield. It looks to me like the wall on the canal just above the Lakefield Lock. Does it look like that to you? Because there's a lot of stonework there. There are, there are young people, there are boys there on this sort of path. But, um, this is the first of several photographs. This is in August. So the, the boat came down in August. It's August. It's probably hot and sticky. It's a lot of the men have got their shirts off. And probably the typical August warm day. And then between this shot, which may be Lakefield and Peterborough, it rained. And by the time they get to the left lock, you can see it's very wet. There's a few people there. Walking, and this is just going into the eastern basin on the top of the lift line. And then, of course, the picture I saw originally is just a few minutes later at the bottom of the, east, of the lift line on the eastern basin uh, when the boat got out of the bottom. And then there's a, there are a couple more of it being put out. Now, there was supposed to be a seventh ship um, delivered, finished delivered in 1943. Uh, there's still obviously a lot of need for anti submarine work in 1943. Um, but the 116 was built by the 100 boats, but it wasn't delivered in 1943 because it was damaged in an explosion in Aurelia. There was a fatality, Stanley Peacock was 18 years old and seven seriously injured. Uh, the 116 was in fact finished in 1944. It was the 74th of the 18 boats all, all, all together. But by June 1944, you know what happened in June 1944, don't you? D-Day. I mean, the war is coming to be closed. But this ship just arriving for anti-submarine work in the North America. So it was very late in the day. The war was over, in fact, within, um, well, in Europe, anyway, within 10 or 11 months after that. So it was actually in service as the reindeer, one of those thick training battles after the war. But this uh, explosion in the 116 took place in October 13, 1943. Uh, the Aurelia Packet and Tyrus um, has it on the front page. Explosion. Uh, Fairmile blown up, one man killed, explosion wrecked Fairmile. Uh, uh, I interviewed Donald Hunter, and he said it was the worst day of his life because he was having dinner. It was about six o'clock in the evening, and he lived within half a mile of it. War, but he heard this massive explosion and he knew what had happened. He'd been in uh, Paxton, had been in Acton, and had a boat yard. So he rushed down there. He said if it, if it had been the first boat, they wouldn't have built anymore, but it was the last one. So that 
because it came toward the end of the contracts anyway. And uh, what happened, it wasn't uh, the worst, it wasn't the worst case scenario because the main gas tank didn't blow. It was the gas that was lying around had leaked through a faulty pump that they into the uh, into this main uh, space, deck space, and when it blown the deck off, the, this is the deck, you see these circular windows, they were, it's not by down basically, but it would have destroyed the whole ship, it would have been the gas tank. The gas tanks were actually very large gas tanks, but they were protected and they were sealed. They could take gunpowder, they could take um, stun damage and not leak, but um, it was it was an act and obviously associated with leak the forty pump. This is a an inspector inspecting from the Department of National Defense. I put this in because this isn't the, the ship or the, the, the launch. It does show you the similar explosion damage that occurred in, in Nova Scotia in 1944, I'm sorry, in Gas Bay. But it also shows you because of the damage, the way that hull was built. They were they were built of wood. And it was planks of mahogany, and they were built in a diagonal. It's called a double diagonal with a membrane, a canvas membrane between. And you can see the plank. You see the planks there? That's the outer skin, and then there'd be uh, the right angles on an inner skin. Anyway, this is another explosion. So they had an investigation. This 21st of October said, uh, Every angle of Fairmount Blast being thoroughly investigated. Then a week later, um, evidence given of inquest gas escaping from a pump lighted by broken electric bulb may have caused the explosion of the Fairmount. Uh, it was a, a, an accident that had one fatality. The, the fatality was a volunteer, an 18 year old um, Stanley Peacock, who actually was an air cadet. Anyway, he was blown about 50 yards from the boat and drowned in the lake. He was injured. He may have been unconscious. He, he was there in but there were some severe injuries, um, although not to other uh, employees. So in 1944, the last of the boats came through, the one of six. You know where this is going? Yeah, the other left one. The little left one. Kirkfield left lot, yeah, Kirkfield. Um, <coughs> and there's a few there's a few people there to watch it. This came through in July 1944, so as I said, it was uh, getting on quite late in the war, really. And um, it's, uh, yeah, so in, okay, the, what did the Fair Miles do? And they were built, obviously, in, near here, they came through Lakefield. Well, then they were really intended for active service on the North Atlantic. So they were time exploits. The length of service that they had varied greatly. The longest, obviously, were the earliest ones. They were both 941 built. They were in service for three and a half years, quite a long time. The shortest was the last one, is only in service for 10 months before the end of the war in Europe. They were based in um, these five location, they weren't all, all five of them, but they were mostly halfbacks in Newfoundland. Um, Newfoundland, as I said, was a Dominion, but there were agreements between the Dominion government of Newfoundland and Canada and the United States for bases, air bases, army bases, and uh, naval bases in Newfoundland, and that's uh, why two of the bases were, were there. Um, there were two periods of operations that the fair models were involved in. The so-called defensive period, which was 1941 to 1943, is the spring of, which was when the U-boats were really active in the Canadian waters. And then after that, uh, the U-boats were withdrawn to a great extent to the, west, the eastern part of the Atlantic. And, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. By late 1942, there were 45 fair miles. And then secondly, after the spring of 1943, it was the so-called offensive period, and by late 1943, 63 had been commissioned. They were in 10 flotillas, and in 1944, there were 66 on the Atlantic and 14 on the Pacific Coast. That's the 80 altogether. 
They were put in flotillas after 1943 because it was more effective. So there were about seven or eight Fairmont flotilla, and there were about eight or nine flotillas at various bases on the East Coast. And in Newfoundland, in fact, one in Bermuda. Uh, the, the two overseas flotillas, overseas being the one in Newfoundland and the one in Bermuda, had mothership. They were, they were an auxiliary supply vessel, HMS provider and an HMS protector. This is the provider. These are they like motherships. They would carry fuel, food, they had workshops for repairs, they had uh, hospital beds and things like that. They weren't armed ships, but they were based uh, in those two overseas areas, Newfoundland and uh, Bermuda. And they had eight or nine uh, fair miles associated with them. So fair miles operated in the flotillas, and they often, this photograph it shows us in line formation. Uh, the Gulf State Lawrence, and uh, I don't know exactly the numbers, the, um, the actual fair miles in these cases. It's difficult to make out the, there's a number there, I can't really be sure. But anyway, it shows a rating of the aircraft, and the aircraft got here. It shows the depth charges. There are six or seven depth charges. Oh, hang on, one, two, three. Six depth charges on either side there, stored. And then there's this gun, or Y gun, they called it, which fired two depth charges on either side um, there. And then you can see the other four or five uh, fair miles in line behind. I did actually manage to find, um, once again, he contacted me uh, just before I gave the talk some years ago, Albert Brooks, who lives on television road in, in Peru. He was on the fair miles at the end of the last year or so of the war. And uh, he gave me kindly let me use some of his pictures. He was 18 years old in 1943. He joined up and um, was, uh, first of all, based in Ottawa, but he wanted more action. So he trained as a torpedo, a torpedo uh, operator. And then got assigned to Fairmile, even though there were no for torpedoes on it, to operate the depth charge. And he was on the 061. That's from 1944 to 45, the last year of the war. That's the parent, by the way, on Magdalene Street. You can see TCBS in the background. Uh, this is one of his pictures. This is the wine gun. It fired two depth charges on either side of the uh, tip. And there's a mechanism there, which is a big pistol. And you push that in or something, and set up the charge. And then in this photograph of the 061 provided by Al Brooks shows on the in, the, in Cape Breton Islands, the Brownwater Lake. It's changed a bit from the, uh, when it first went through Lakefield, got the destructive pattern on it, for one thing. This is the Y gun, this is the anti aircraft gun. You know, this is a comparison of the photograph near Lakefield and the one in three years later. Which was the new, oh yeah, they repainted the number. Um, other exploits, they were mainly involved in escorting convoys, part of the way across the Atlantic anyway. Um, they fired death charges to attack submarines, although there are no recorded pills. They might have been damage done. A lot of the targets, it's sort of like shooting in the dark because you couldn't see the submarine. You had to use the detecting mechanism, which was called ASDIC, it was an acoustic distance, the uh, active distance um, detection mechanism under the boat. And they could easily mistake other things for submarines, like fish or whales or logs. And the temptation to drop a death charge must have been when there was no active submarine there. There was no use of the deck armaments in action. They were only small cogs in a mighty wartime machine. This shows the idea that depth, the boat goes along and drops the depth charges and they blow up behind the boat. That's not a hunter boat, by the way. Noteworthy incidents, the O6 zone did actually rescue 50 people from a sinking crater off the Newfoundland in August 1943. The O92 was on an extended visit in the 73rd flotilla to the Caribbean patrol in 1942-43. The O19 was in a flotilla guarding 
for you to break in on 30, 40, 40, 45. That was a really tough uh, assignment. That's uh, 10 months or 8, 15 months in Bermuda. Those are the people who went down the lift lock. We thought that they know they were going to be going to Bermuda. Anyway, I looked at the archives and the logbooks are all there. Um, this is a, the logbook from the 060. It's got a, a canvas C cover for the log that could be changed. The book were changed. Several things in the beginning. And the book basically had a very standardized format with columns and rows. Each row is an hour of a day, so each double page is a day. It starts off at zero hours in the morning, and the bottom line is midnight. And you're supposed to fill in the columns, so you can see most of them are not filled in. And this is the case. They become very, very predictable because there's no one happening. And it shows the wind direction and the, the direction of, of travel. And occasionally, other thing. Um, the 05 logbook on the 10th of November, for example, 1943, was the, the first ship birthday. So they, they pay 1,200 hours birthday party for ship first birthday. It was very unusual. And then this is the 106 on the 8th of May, 1945, DE Day, um, was proclaimed on that day. Um, mostly the entries are in pencil, in indelible pencil, so it can't be easily erased. But occasionally they're in ink, and ink meant trouble actually. And this one was an ink, no, this was an ink entry. It's written by uh, an officer in Halifax Harbor. Watch, correct, put him out to release, then it says 2314, that's 1114 at night. Officer of the guard on board, as the guard boat was not hailed, put him out to warn, no officer on board this or any other boat along, alongside. So presumably the officers were in the mess or on the shore or something like that. Anyway, other incidents, there were a few collisions and groundings. The 093 collided in harbor with another boat. Uh, the 085 ran and grounded in 1943, in Red Bay. Uh, I'm just going to draw attention to this particular incident because I have a photograph of one thing. And uh, I, I said to you that very few women involved in these naval stories, even one of the women. Um, it, she was a reporter for the uh, Naval magazine, which she was interviewing. Obviously, there's a photograph taken in the winter. I think it's probably Halifax, so it might have been Red Bay. I'd like to think it's Red Bay, Labrador, it's probably Halifax. Now, this is uh, the offender, uh, command, commanding officer, commanding officer, Southern Man Gavin Clark. He was 21 years old, or 20 or 21 years old, he was in charge of this. Uh, only five uh, loading launch. Anyway, the photograph shows him and this reporter is a wren, member of the women's world in the Navy service, and they borrowed some upkits from somewhere. And you can see the fair miles in the background, there's one with brown windows there. They brown windows came in, by the way, back in 1944, and then the one with gray windows came Anyway, Gavin Clark managed to run aground in Red Bay, Labrador. Has anybody been to Red Bay? You love them going to it. It's fantastic sight. But it's a very good harbor. And in the warm weather, the neutral man was based in Red Bay. You see, we are right on the, um, right on the, uh, Belle Isle Strait. And there's a good place for patrolling there. And anyway, this is a report of collision or grounding. I hope to go into great detail, but, you can just imagine this 20 year old or 21 year old captain got a 680 horsepower boat and he's in charge of the crew and he's very excited in, in these particular operations, which they were practicing shelling, firing the gun at a target on the cliff. And they were going round and round inside Red Bay. It was a very protected harbor on the north side of the Strait of Battle Isle, Newfoundland. Just he did from that island on the right, this is great. And he managed to hit a lot there and uh, damage the well, they were firing the cliff here, going round and round and round the red bay. 
Three things on the most historic places in Canada. The first letter written from Canada to Europe in about 1580 was written from Red Bay by a vast whaler, a vast whale, the uh, caught whales there. Anyway, it's, it's a very good museum. Uh, but Canon Clark Master rode his boat onto the rocks. He knocked off the Arctic dome and bent one of the propellers that popped over the boat. And he was the very recommended, uh, reprimanded. So at the end of the fair miles, they were decommissioned in June 1945. And because Canada spent so much money on the war, they wanted to get money back as quick as possible by selling off the assets, the old assets. In fact, they formed a war asset corporation way before the end of the war, anticipating this need. So they had a very large auction in uh, June 1945 at Sorel, Quebec, which is a fancy port of the world. And the Fairmile is one of the best selling of all the boats. Not many people wanted a destroyer or a cruiser, but the Fairmiles were sort of small enough to have appeal. So they sold very well. Um, and they also sold very cheaply. The government set a price of $3,500. For a fair mile. Now, most people didn't earn $3,500 in 1945. I don't know what the average salary was. It's probably $2,000 or something like that. So there's a lot of money for most people, but they were stacked up. They were what, that was one twentieth of the building cost, or about seven thousand dollars And some of them were very, very new. So in December 1945, only six remained in service, including one on six, which they did not, in fact, sell. They held on to that because it was basically brand new. And it was renamed the uh, Patrol Training Crowd, PTC 716, and then HMC at Reindeer, and it operated on the Great Lakes, the Great Vessel Pool of the Reserves, and also the British Dead. And the RCMP also acquired the four ten miles after the war for patrol. So after the Second World War, I just want to say this, because another suppose did come through Lakefield, and you may remember this. We are far too young to remember in the to take you may remember that the Hunterboat's last warship was the HSPF Blue Heron. And it was one of four patrol craft. They weren't armed, they were named after the Bill of the Bird Series. This was the Blue Heron was made in, in Aurelia. And it came through in the summer of 1956. This date's wrong. It says the 29th of January. That is not right. Probably is too anyway, I've got several pictures with this. This is one thing, I don't know where it is. It may well be entering a lock upstream from Peterborough or between Lakefield and Peterborough. Could be. It was a 782 HNCS Blue Heron, a Greek HNCS Blue Heron on the light room. This is one of Frank Lincoln's, I think, closer to Hamilton. And uh, you can see the Really, this was commissioned on the Kikuchi thing, actually. It was an interesting thing. It was entirely adapted, coming down with naval personnel. On. And then this might be below Campbell Road, coming to Blue Heron, HSDS Blue Heron, see that? HSDS Blue Heron. And then this is the, on patrol, probably on the ocean. It was only in commission for about 10 months, and then it um, decommissioned. So what does it all mean? Well, is it, I just put these things in to try and get some sort of conclusion. Um, even though Ontario has no sea trucks, it had a maritime law. Now, the, you should immediately say it does have a sea coast, actually. You should you say that again. It does have a sea coast. It's a trick question, but statement. But the sea coast is James Bay and it's not particularly relevant. Uh, but it did have a role because of the Great Lakes and they built ships. In 1941, the Q060 and the O61 were the first warships on the Trent Canal. And you wouldn't say, normally think of them being on the Trent Canal. However, it has been a military route historically. And if you think about Champlain and the First Nations, it was a routeway of important in the prehistoric time. I think the ships on the upper part of the Canal, the summit, were the highest warships ever in the world. And uh, what this really points to is how 
the amount of effort the Canadians made during World War II, even though far from the ocean there were boatyards and uh, people involved in making warships, Al Hunter hired scores, if not hundreds, of farmers and other people who had fields, like carpentry fields, to make these wooden boats. And they were all, they may be grateful for their job, but they also contributed to the effort. Okay. So, questions, where are the Hunter Boat Limited Records? We couldn't find them all. Where are the Ontario Fair Mile Association Records? Where are the Fair Miles were to come? And then, what was the economic and social benefit of military technology in broad area in World War II? Those are questions that could be answered. This is from the, one of the pages in the log book of the 060, which is also from the Maricos of Bell. Marcus Buddy Bear Marvin Greenwich was right. Okay, that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? say that there is a booklet uh, which I wrote from the Peterborough Historical Society on this topic uh, on the site table if you want to buy one at five dollars. What, what, did I just say something about Al Brooks? I forgot to say that Al Brooks, who was a gentleman on television, wrote who was actually in the Royal Canadian Navy, and is still alive, was on a fair mile in Peterborough and he was subsequently serving on that same fair mile. In 1941, his sister was dating one of his sailors, and the sailor asked him, well, went on the boat in Peterborough in Little Lake, went to her, and he got to sneak on with them. So little did he know that at age 15, he was going to be on that same boat three years later in the North Atlantic. She's been a past story. Okay, presenting or what? Yeah, yeah. Hand no, the, 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 the